So welcome everyone. Um, we've already started, as you can hear, the conversation's already begun and I really would like to keep it conversational. So um, I'm gonna do a brief introduction and um, it's really great to see everyone. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the students who are also part of um, tonight's um, event. My name is Shauna McCabe and I'm the director of the Art Gallery of Guelph. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all as well as our guests, Sally Freider, Takalik Partridge and Vince Rosario. I'm really looking forward to this conversation tonight. To begin, I'd like to offer land acknowledgement on behalf of the Art Gallery of Guelph, which is hosting this dialogue. This statement is really crucial for cult cultural institutions um, because it really confronts the ongoing effects of colonialism that underpins the history of institutions like museums and art museums. Um, not only have these institutions utilized deeply colonial methods of representation, but because of their authority, um, these narratives have been accepted as truth in forming policies and practices. Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. We acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Guelph resides on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabek peoples who are the ancestral holders and today the treaty holders of this land. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon covenant to this land and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. We express our gratitude and recognize our responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live, work and create. And as we're all gathered virtually today, connected and yet physically dispersed, it's also a good moment to recognize how the different traditional lands we reside in and move through and form our lives. And we acknowledge the elders past, present and future of these lands with gratitude and respect. A few details, everyone has been muted um, for this conversation and we invite you to use the chat area uh, for any questions uh, for the curators and we will turn to the questions after the conversation. Um, but do feel free if you put them in the chat, we'll also deal with them as, as we go along as well. Um, so tonight we're talking about um, curatorial practice. Uh, hang on, my, my notes just jumped. Um, and curation um, and about care. And this is sort of the, the kind of thought I had sort of posed to the, our three guests tonight. Um, the term curator itself originates um, in the Latin term curo, which means to care for. And that has obviously shifted over, over time. It's meaning, um, you know, obviously originated, associated with um, objects um, to care for. And today it's very much um, uh, the care of relationships and uh, a guiding principle for curators of contemporary art today um, in many contexts is an ethics of care with attention to the relationships between artists and creative practices and communities and an aim to support wider social change. And at the same time, we might ask that while care uh, may be embedded in the act of curatorial practice, is it something that is actually considered in um, the act of curating in contemporary institutions? And when is it considered and how? So tonight we'll look at notions of stewardship in relation to and beyond the work of um, these three curators whose exhibitions are currently on view at the Art Gallery of Guelph. Um, projects that offer nuanced explorations of distinct colonial histories and anti-colonial approaches. So to introduce everyone, um, Sally Freider is, uh, hang on, key forward here. Uh, Sally Freider is the curator of contemporary art at the Art Gallery of Guelph. Um, she holds an honors BA in studio art from the University of Guelph and an MA in contemporary art from the University of Manchester, Sotheby's Institute of Art. The former curator of modern and contemporary art at the Ulrich Center, or sorry, Alec Museum of Art. She has also organized exhibitions for Illuminato, the McCall Center for Art and Innovation, the Glassell School of Art at the Museum of Fine Arts at Houston, Project Row Houses, Justina Barnicky Gallery at the University of Toronto, the Print Studio Center 3, and A Space Gallery. She's a former um, a core Critical Studies Fellow at the Glassell's Museum, sorry, the Glassell School at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and recently curated the exhibition Interweavings at Center 3 for artistic social and social practice. She's involved in a number of curatorial collaborations, um, and she'll tell you what her curatorial practice centers on in a second. Um, we'll just go through, these are some of the exhibitions that Sally has curated for the Art Gallery of Guelph. This is Sandra Brewster. 
um, this is not for the Art Gallery of Guelph, but with in conjunction with Native Art Department International, Tokens of Appreciation at Center 3. This was at the Art Gallery of Guelph. Uh, the collective decolonized this place. When we breathe, we breathe together. And this is the current exhibition, Duit El Petros Prospetto Amare, which is on view currently. And another view of that exhibition. Um, Takalit Partridge is a Danuk curator, artist, and performer from Nunavut, um, often incorporating sp spoken word and throat singing. Um, her performance practice focuses on Inuit experiences and ontologies, both in the North and the South. As well as her work as an artist, her writing has been featured in several magazines and was, uh, she was selected as the first Anuk editor uh, at large at uh, M4 Inuit Art Quarterly. She was recently named the director of the Nordic Lab, which is an experimental research and production space designed to foster collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous groups uh, in the Arctic, and that is based out of Saw Gallery in Ottawa. She has also curated a number of projects, including those at the Art Gallery of Ontario uh, and the Art Gallery of Guelph, among others. Um, these are, this is a project uh, for the Art Gallery of Ontario, featuring, featuring um, Kanojuak Ashavak and Tim Pitsiluk. This is an exhibition, How to Map Every Day, Every Day, in the Art Gallery of Guelph. And this is the uh, images from the current exhibition, Inusira, Teralik Duffy with Pitsila Kashuna. Spider exhibition. Uh, this was your, in, your installation at uh, the Biennale of Sydney from 2020. So writing, just to sort of highlight that writing is a big part of, of your work. Um, and this in, interest in Inuit experiences run through, runs through everything, uh, writing to curatorial to performance. And finally, Vince Rosario uh, is an independent critic, curator, writer, arts administrator, and community organizer who's based in Toronto. Uh, he was born in Bangladesh, raised in Dubai, and eventually settling in Canada. They attempt to map out trajectories of modernism, queerness, and decolonial futures across transnational axes. Uh, they have presented curatorial projects at X Space Cultural Centre, Gladstone Hotel, and the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Centre as well as contributing to exhibitions, text for Whippersnapper Gallery, InterAccess, and Gallery 44. They were the winner of the 2018 C New Critics Award um, and published criticism in C Magazine and MoMAS. Uh, they currently serve on the Whippersnapper Gallery Board of Directors, and in 2021, Vince was awarded the Middlebrook Prize for Young Canadian Curators with Mitra Fakashrafi, uh, producing the exhibition Collective Offerings at the Art Gallery of Guelph. <clears throat> and that is this exhibition. So several views of that installation. And some other projects, uh, Unvanishing Traces at X Space. Again, this off-site installation. So there we go. So I'm just gonna like leave these images up so we can return to them as we talk. Um, so, you know, we're talking about curating, um, but it's as much a discussion of how art uh, can forge crucial and critical dialogues around history, identity, and social justice. And I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, we can start with you, you sort of speaking to your exhibitions about, um, you know, what, what you think the possibilities for curating is in the contemporary moment. Um, and obviously relationships is a big part of, of this. And we've kind of raised that in different um, iterations already in this conversation, um, but how you think about relationships and, and creating these exhibitions and how they shape the, the, the work and the images we see here. So Takula, do you want, oh, sorry, you asked to go last. <laughs> so Sally, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Um... I guess um, in terms of, I'm not even sure what part of that because that was kind of this broad overarching statement to begin with. Um, so in terms of, I guess what I can just say is that in terms of um, 
working with, uh, when I approach um, artists to work on a project, it's usually either that I'm, I have a premise that I'm interested in or a preposition and, or sort of a question that I want to have answered. And then, or it could be that I'm intrigued by a particular artist or a collective's um, practice. And so usually um, the point of collaboration or relationship building begins with an invitation to engage and to work collaboratively. And and I was thinking, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about this notion of being like a steward for curators. And um, I was thinking about how, I was mainly thinking about it at first in terms of how I build relationships with artists. And this could be something, it's usually through this sort of process of um, kind of, having an invitation to have a sort of preliminary conversation. And then there's usually a process through which you either, and it doesn't always unfold this way, but for me frequently, there's this sort of process in which, you know, an artist will speak about their work and their practice. And then I'll, occasionally I will speak about the work that I do as a curator because it's sort of like we're entering into this. I don't want to say like a dance, but you're, 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 um, you're kind of opening up this dialogue in which you're both to different extents um, beginning to reveal things about yourself to the other. And you're about to embark on what is what can be, it's not always, but what can be this very sort of um, intimate engagement. And, and there's a way in which it's really interesting because I remember when I was first starting out as a curator, or I was interested in working as a curator when I was much younger, and I had a colleague whose partner was a curator, and this person kept telling me, you know, curating is a lot of administrative work. It's a lot of administrative work. And it is, but then there's this whole other part to it. Um, which is about sort of negotiating relationships and, and doing this, this sort of intimate work of um, both revealing and discovering. And in terms of, um, so I see it, it's usually more of sort of this kind of back and forth um, process where sort of I can propose something, the artist will respond, and then I respond to that. And it could be this could be in terms of, um, it could be like, this is a, you know, a curatorial um, rubric that I put forth to them and then they might respond to it. And then I will respond through either interpreting the work through a didactic or writing, or it could be a tour. Um, and then sometimes it's, it's more along the lines of, I get to know, um, I'll get to know an artist's um, practice and I'll get to know an artist and then I'll kind of propose how I'm interpreting the work. And with Dawit's current exhibition that's up, um, Prospero Amare, that was a bit different um, because he, this is part of a three, sort of a three part um, or a sort of an exhibition. It's, this body of work is the second of three exhibitions that are that are sort of interrogating this extended um, premise. And so the artist had a very clear idea of of how um, of what the exhibition would be, of what works would be produced um, in terms of how it would be laid out. And so my role in this project was more that of a facilitator. Um, but there, there were certain points where I did sort of um, weigh in on, on the layout, but it was, a very, it was a very different process. But one of the things um, to sort of respond to an earlier point that you raised that I did do with this is 
um, the way that Dawit works, like he's interested in these, these um, like very broadly to describe his practice, he's interested in language and in history um, and in these intersections between uh, notions of, of the modern and migration um, and Africa. And there are things that, and of course, all of these questions or these explorations, they lend themselves to probing notions of colonialism and, and looking at these kind of um, intersections between, or these kind of entanglements between um, the sort of broader project of modernity and colonialism. And so, the, and, and photography and the sort of role that photography plays in that. So there were points, um, the things that he was exploring, they were things that they, they were things that, um, that also intersected with things that I'm interested in exploring as well. But it was a very, it was a very different way of working. Sorry, Vince, I, I didn't have my new job. Vince, do you want to speak next? Oh, you need. Sorry, hi. Um, to the idea of curating and care specifically? Yeah, and maybe relationships. Sure, yeah. Um, so in a lot of ways, I kind of accidentally fell into curating. I mean, not quite. Thankfully, it was early enough on in my education. So I started school for architecture, realized I wasn't a very good draftsman, um, and then realized I liked art history more um, and had the opportunity to see an exhibition being put up at the Guggenheim and sort of go behind the scenes and see all of those fun things. Um, and before realizing that that is like the top 1% of the 1% um, in the art world, and that's not necessarily how things work. Um, that said though, it did kind of, spark an interest in um, relate like late modernist relational practices. Um, and so, you know, I've been following kind of artist groups like the Kutai or, you know, Boxus and other kind of sort of clusters, uh, accumulations of artists. Um, and then of course, due to the relative precarity of arts work, um, in this financial climate. Um, after I left school, I um, found myself curating less and working in groups of kind of creatives more. Like uh, I co-founded a grassroots DIY arts festival um, called Bricks and Glitter, which is affiliated to a space called Unit 2, which is um, in West End Toronto. It's a DIY space. It's kind of the last one of the last of its kind in a lot of ways. Toronto had this great proliferation of kind of DIY spaces between the 90s and roughly about 2010, 2011, um, when, you know, sort of progressive waves of gentrification began sort of displacing them. Um, and so a lot of my uh, sort of methodologies come, are, are, are informed by those contexts right? Um, these kind of places where you find encounters between people who are like a vastly different kind of socioeconomic locations, um, have vastly different politics, and, and you find ways of kind of negotiating between all of that. Um, and, and I guess the point of the exercise ultimately becomes to focus on a common end uh, a common sort of basis of solidarity and to move forward that way. Um, and that's very much what Bricks and Glitter became about. Um, you know, we were sort of uh, a whole generation of like malcontents uh, who weren't being represented by Pride Toronto. So we came at it from very different places. Um, and then we sort of all collectively settled on this idea of building resources and infrastructure for emerging queer artists many of whom, of course, are underrepresented in many ways. Um, and so 
collaboration has kind of been at the heart of most like curatorial projects that I've done. So Unbanishing Traces, which is on screen right now, um, I collaborated with uh, Sanjay Pillen, a good friend of mine and a very talented curator. Um, and that came out of a very kind of personal encounter with loss, um, kind of, it was trying to come to terms with um, these spectacularized mediated deaths, which sort of came in very quick succession that year um, between um, Colton Bushi and, uh, you know, the Bruce MacArthur murders. A lot of it was like felt really intensely in the community of people that I was, um, you know, um, engaged with. Um, so this exhibition really was an attempt to think through um, the violences which we compound on people when we sort of engage in these like sort of culturally sanctioned forms of mourning and remembering, right? The ways we erase the complexity of their lives and the ways in which we uh, sort of inevitably contribute to like an ongoing cycle of violence and how can you sort of use visual and mediated means of, of disrupting that. Um, all this to sort of say that um, generally speaking, in terms of curatorial propositions, and perhaps this is a bit of a product of ego and inexperience, they tend to be um, issues that affect me directly quite, uh, quite forcefully. Um, and so from that, I tend to turn to the people around me who I know are also thinking through or feeling through these things, and we get together and start working on something. Um, and that's very much what Collective Offerings was about. Um, uh, it was this moment where so many kinds of physical collectivity that we sort of nurtured in different community spaces fell away. Um, and suddenly there was this urgency not only to connect, but to support each other. And, you know, we were seeing the, a groundswell of like mutual aid movements. It was really quite beautiful for, for a very brief moment and then everything went soured and now we have truckers um, protesting. Um, I'm like, oh God, so much hope. Um, so it was really inspired by that moment and it was inspired by um, uh, ways of finding kind of alternatives to collecting, to collectivizing and thinking together and kind of finding ways of attuning both with, with the land, with each other, with ourselves, um, and to kind of try to fight this like compartmentalization that sets in when you kind of start applying capitalist and colonial logics onto this kind of work. Um, and so I was really inspired by the work of a lot of my friends who were doing that kind of work. Uh, for example, the centerpiece of the show is um, Shaista Latif's How I Learned to Serve Tea. And Shaista was running this project, um, both in kind of theater spaces, but also at community centers as like the, the sort of uh, ostensible reason was that she was teaching newcomers English, spoken English, but it was actually a way of getting them to think about the power structures that they were being called into. Um, in this like network of agencies and sort of uh, settlement procedures and how they manage kind of um, these populations. Um, and, you know, in very early on in the project, it became very clear that it could not be like a solo endeavor, uh, curatorially at least. Um, and so um, I teamed up with Mitra who has, you know, um, a wonderful record of kind of bringing people together and, and really, understanding how to intentionally create community in a space um, and collaboratively we were able to create something that that could speak to those complex needs um, without necessarily tokenizing these practices without necessarily um, sort of illustrating things um, through the work, but rather providing little kernels, little, little strategies, things that people can take away and, and, and bring into their social lives, into their everyday lives. So that was kind of broadly speaking. Um, and then that's kind of how I tend to navigate relationships uh, professionally. 
That said, I think it's really difficult when you work with friends who are as precarious as you often. Um, and there is kind of this line between like affective labor, um, which is, you know, you interacting with them, with them as a curator, and then like, you know, actually just like being their friend. Um, and how do you kind of navigate between the two? Um, and that's something I'm still learning to figure out. Um, and overall, mostly I've curated group shows. The idea has been to try to bring the work in conversation somehow. Um, and so it ends up being quite site specific. Uh, the How I Learned to Serve Tea installation was developed specifically for this space, as was uh, Meech Blake and Christina Kingsbury's project, um, which is uh, an event score. Uh, for a walk along the Aramosa River, which Christina has been um, engaging with and caring for that piece of land for like a very long time um, in her own kind of way. Um, and sort of pairing that with Meech, who also um, looks at kind of, you know, ways of creating non-extractive relationships with the land, um, ways of kind of existing in symbiosis. And of course, so much of that is indebted to indigenous knowledge. Um, and yeah, we were able to even through the course of this project, um, and this was some of, one of the really beautiful things that came out of it is we were able to bring Meech and Christina together and they um, really ran with it. They created this very rich body of research around their own kind of respective um, bodies of knowledge around this work. Um, and we were able to create this beautiful poetic text that I hope can kind of live on past the duration of the exhibition. So yeah, that's kind of, I guess, how I navigate relationships in, in, in this kind of practice. Um, I know, I know you had a lot of conversations, like even in, throughout the development, selection of the work, the development of each work, the support for each work. So, yeah, which are ongoing, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a constant negotiation because of COVID and like health restrictions. Um, yeah, I mean, we knew which artists we wanted to work with and we had a broad contour of what projects we were going to bring into the space. But ultimately it was always just like negotiating with like what was there. Um, and I'm trying to figure out a way of kind of formalizing that methodology, like a certain kind of fugitivity and responsiveness that can be adaptive and mobile. I think the traditional way in which you're taught how to curate tends to be quite like static in some ways. Um, to think about objects in a space over a long duration of time, to think about um, development from the, pro from the perspective of kind of arranging objects. Um, and so I'm trying to understand different ways of approaching that as well. And so this was a sort of ongoing endeavor in, in that process. Thanks. Tuckerlick. Can you sort of repeat the gist of your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, I think even just thinking about you know, the development of this, this exhibition and this exhibition, I mean, you're working with people, you know, you know, you know their work. Um, so in terms of like the relationships that you're, you're kind of, you already have the relationships and the exhibitions are emerging from, from those. Um, maybe you want to speak about this project? Just. Yeah, so that exhibition was part of um, my kind of, not intervention, what's the word? The activity that I did in connection with the residency that I was doing with Musagetis. Um, as you know, uh, I work with Elwood Jimmy. I've worked with Elwood Jimmy, who's a wonderful curator, artist, thinker, writer. Um, and, you know, we've become really good friends, but um, I first started working with him as an artist. He had me uh, to, over to Toronto for some performances. And then in conjunction with that uh, residency, um, we were looking for a space to put on this show. And of course, Shauna, you offered that space at the Art Gallery of Guelph, and that's what brought me to where I am today. <laughs> um, that show was really, Havdamat is, you know, every day or every single day. Um, 
I wanted to show uh, images from Inuit life that are just that people share on social media that are just um, pictures that are not necessarily meant to be beautiful, but they can end up being beautiful. And they just show Inuit perspectives about things. And I feel that Inuit have very particular Inuit way of looking at things. Um, and then some of these photographers are actually, they actually work as photographers and some of them are just people uh, who, you know, take photos with even like an older version of an iPod. Um, in, in all the work that I, in all the exhibitions that I do, I really want to center uh, Inuit voices, Inuit perspectives, and to have them presented in ways that are legible and else can, you know, experience them from those perspectives. So this one, like I said, it's about um, Inuit perspectives about everyday life and uh, what people value in their everyday lives as Inuit living in the North and living elsewhere. Um, some people though, didn't send me photos that I asked for because they were kind of embarrassed by them. Like, I really, like some people post pictures of dirty dishes in the sink, for example, like frequently they'll say, oh, look at this huge pile of dishes, you know, because my family was over and we all had like this big meal or whatever. Like they were too embarrassed. So that the negotiating part in this thing was like trying to get people to understand that, no, I do want the photos of the everyday things and they can be blurry and they can be mm -hmm. something that's almost uninteresting. Like look at the mess the puppy made in the porch, you know, like ripped up all these plastic bags. Like I wanted that photo, but <laughs> I couldn't get it out of this one person because they were like, why? Why would you <laughs> want that? I so, see. I mean, like this, it's not necessarily art the way that we think of art but for me it's there is some kind of creative um, force in in any of these things that we do where we end up making something and taking a photo is making something so that's what that one was about and one of the artists in this show was Tara Lick Duffy yeah. um, and then I guess also just to say sort of out of, out of this exhibition, um, I approached Taka like about doing, taking this idea of how to match and every day, every day um, and make it much bigger because I had sort of recognized that idea as being so key to the Inuit work in our collection and, and sort of manifest in many different ways. And so we're, that exhibition is going to be, uh, it will be on view starting like April, late April, early May. Um, and so, um, but in the process, so Takalik began a residency with us um, and uh, has been working with, with us in the adjunct curator, kind of thinking and looking at our collection and developing this exhibition. And as part of that, we kind of decided to do this. <laughs> but this came out of a conversation we've had with Takalik. Right, so Takalik Duffy is, um... Also a good friend of mine, also somebody that I met initially through um, artistic practice work stuff. Um, but we happen to be named after the same person. And in Inuit culture, this means that we have a connection to each other and a relation um, that is particular to that kind of uh, naming. We're upvakuid, uh, which is like, we're parts of a whole. So all the people, there's many people named after this late elder. Um, who, she was a woman, but uh, the, in Inuktitut, the, the traditional names don't have a gender. So it could have been anybody, but it was a woman. Um, and she has many namesakes. I guess they're namesakes, after, the ones who are named after the namesake, are they also namesakes? Anyway, any many people named after her, uh, including lots of her relatives. And, you know, there's a young man that I know and, um, anyway, so we have that name connection, but we also, uh, you know, we grew up in sort of similar places, although we didn't grow up together. Uh, we grew up with a lot of similar experiences and that, you know, 
in the 80s and the 90s. And um, one of the things that we had in common was just really, really adoring the work of Petula Ashuna. So there's a book, uh, Pictures of My Life, that is also part of the exhibition. It's a well-known book in, in, in the Inuit art world, anyway, well-known book by Dorothy Eber um, from the 1970s, right? Seven, early 70s. And I, as a child, would spend so many hours looking at this book, of course, not reading the, the text, but just looking at the pictures and being so fascinated by the fact that there were pictures by an Inuk made with felt pen in a book, like an actual book like that. And I think that she had very similar thoughts about that. And, and just, I could picture, even though they're just kind of simple graphic drawings, they're so, for me, they're so rich with information. And I could, as a child, I could picture what was happening in those photos and I could picture the feelings. Um, I could feel the things that they evoke. For example, the photo in, in that, on the right, the big image by Pitsula Rashona, the mosquitoes are these giant, very simply drawn forms, but I know that feeling of the mosquitoes being huge and many and just things that you can't get away from in the summer in the north. Um, and then so we, Shana and I were talking about, well, what could this next kind of iteration of Khalta Madri and Inu Sira, um, the title for Inu Sira we chose, Takalik uh, and I chose together. Uh, I had invited her to um, do some image, draw some images kind of in response to the work by Pitsila Ashuna. She was already doing images that were kind of of a similar vein anyway, um, but then she created new works um, specifically for this show. And I'm really happy with the result. I think for me, it's like I said, it's just, it's always, I want to see as much as possible in, um, in these spaces that are not, that have, oftentimes shown Inuit work, but wholly divorced from Inuit people. And I wanna see work uh, presented by Inuit, made by Inuit, described by Inuit, and accessible to Inuit in ways that, um, you know, the Inuit art movement has maybe not necessarily taken our community members into account before. And that's sort of informing the summer exhibition as well. The one to come. You want me to talk about that? <laughs> sure, you can talk about it. Well, I mean, the next, the, so the last kind of uh, installment of Hautamad is this bigger one on, on the main floor for starting in spring until through summer. And that has many more of the works that are already part of the AGG, AGG collection. And also um, I've invited several artists from various Inuit communities to contribute new work. So to have that work alongside these older works in the collection, um, to kind of um, have them speak to each other and to present, uh, present the work in ways that I feel are meaningful to Inuit. And sometimes I think, um, my approach is like a little bit, what's the word, simple. Like I really like pop art, for example. <laughs> um, but it's just, for me, it's just about valuing those things that are valuable to Inuit um, and not really worrying about what, uh, what they're in contrast to, I guess. It's just, it's really just about that. What, what, what do Inuit like? And Vince, you said you had heard Takalik in a, in a talk. Yeah, I mean, so actually it's so, it's so lovely being on the panel with you because uh, for Unvanishing Traces, actually. Um, so I know, I knew of Takalik through Elwood as well. Um, who is that Mr. Geddes in Guelph? Um, and Elwood had shared this poem by Takulik. Um, 
and it was it was just like this kind of even it was it was about kind of people witnessing what was happening in the media at the time with Colton Boucher's uh, murder. Um, and it was just like, you know, even the doctors, even the nurses, even the people. So it, it, this kind of, yeah. So I, I think that poem inspired me so much in, in, in trying to think about, you know, these, these forms of collective mourning, um, the shock of that moment and how you come to terms with it. Um, how you bring your own narrative histories to it. Um, so in that way, Kakalik's work has been informative to now, like both of the large shows that I've curated. Um, and then uh, two springs, like last spring? Last spring, I was in a class um, where we were adapting Tuni Kushini into like a virtual format um, for Anna Hudson. And um, Takralik and the curators of the show uh, kind of spoke to us about like what consensus-based curating looks like um, and how you kind of work through sort of a show as a group. Um, and that's something that I really took away uh, for collective offerings because it couldn't be a singular vision in that way, so. Yes. Other, I guess there's sort of like the, there's the conceptual genealogies, right? But <laughs> um, how we're influenced by, by others and each other. Um, do you think, I guess, I mean, empathy plays a big piece of this. Um, and I think, you know, I know uh, for you, Vince, that was sort of, um, you know, sort of making sure that the, the exhibition uh, collective offerings is, is um, dealing with, um, you know, this moment, but there's also this sort of like sense of um, empathy and kind of um, uh, like a different sort of a, a different level of, of relationship, right? Um, you know, facilitation, um, support. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so difficult to enact though within like the way we do exhibitions, you know, in the sense that there are production schedules and timelines and kind of, um, you know, the cycle of grants. Um, materially kind of showing up for people sometimes can be really difficult. Um, and in order to kind of supplement that, I think I tried as much as I could um, to sort of also contribute sort of labor towards developing different artist practices. Um, you know, whether it was through offering like grant writing help or things like that. Um, it's been really nice also kind of getting to share space with the artists, like just like having meals with them. Like last week, um, Meech who lives in Portland uh, was in town and I went with them to go see Christina um, and we sort of had a meal together and it was really lovely. Christina made um, this beautiful uh, uh, dinner for us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, I don't know if I necessarily think of it as empathy so much as like, it's finding a collective way of dealing with the scarcity and precarity that I guess a lot of arts workers face and trying to sort of keep these relationships intact because for me, that seems to be the only way that you can build a platform of sorts. Um, and also as an antidote to the kind of the model minority culture that we've sort of established um, in the arts, especially in Canada, I'd say. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I, if I necessarily see it as empathy. I think it would be disingenuous to call it empathy in some ways, because it is after all a, a professional and material relationship at the end of the day. Um, so at least in a work context, I, I think of it as like, collectively working towards something and, and, and finding an alignment. Um, certainly like at, outside of that, in terms of our personal relationship, absolutely. There's a lot of care there and, um, and which is mutual very much. Um, I felt as held by the artists that I worked with uh, on this show as, yeah, as the expectation would have been for me. Sally, um... 
I know that you have done, I want to just pull up the, so this, I mean, so working with Decolonize This Place, you want to talk about that project a bit? Because it was another one that kind of took a very different format, um, you know, how the exhibition came together, what's in the exhibition. Um, well, again, this project, this project was interesting because of, um, I think it was the last um, project that I brought forward. Um, the from the I guess from the first time that I worked at the Art Gallery of Guelph, mm -hmm. and I had been I had been familiar with decolonize this place um, from my time during the States. I had read about a number of projects that they had done, a number of actions that they were involved in. And um, and it was interesting because I had done I had done a number of projects, including there's a slide that um, there's documentation of um, the Sandra Brewster exhibition, token mm -hmm. uh, token contemporary ongoing, and then I did a project with Maria Hupfield. Like the first three exhibitions that I worked with, they were dealing with colonization. Um, these kind of histories or um, kind of residual effects of colonization in, in very different ways um, and from different geographical regions. Um, and then I did a project with, um, with Carolina Quesero and Clemencia Echeverri, two, two different installations, but they were dealing with, they were, again, they were dealing with sort of like this, this, uh, they were sort of taking on this kind of eco-criticism approach to exploring issues of colonization. And then um, I had been kind of, I had been wanting to do a project with Decolonize This Place. I had been working on a, I had, was part of a steering committee and we had invited them to come and speak at a, at a sort of series of workshops um, called the reception that took place in Hamilton and and we weren't able to to work that out but I had been wanting to do something with them and then it kind of popped into my head and it sort of made sense in terms of all of the exhibitions that I had been been looking at to <laughs> to be working with this collective that was dealing with like dealing with this kind of all of these different threads of colonization and and the space of the institution whether it was a museum or um, a university or different, you know, other types of institutions in this very overt way. It was, it was really kind of like, you know, this, I don't know, I, I still haven't figured out how to like sort of articulate that. But the thing that was interesting about working with them is they were open to doing a project, but they're like, we, we don't really make work for institutions. And they didn't want to do something that was just this archive um of past projects that they had done so what they they decided to actually we had talked about doing that and then they they decided that they wanted to sort of use this this opportunity to sort of look back at some of the things that they had done and and people that they had collaborated with and um actions that they had taken and what was successful about them and so it was an opportunity for them as a collective to kind of look inward, but then also to do what it what it is that they often do, which is to collaborate with with others in action. And one of the things that was interesting was that some of some of the people who they had collaborated with, such as um, Nikinak Migwans and Maria Hupfield and uh, Jason Luhan were now here, well, in Ontario. And so they were based in New York and, and it was very much about um, kind of like, I need to describe what they did. They had a series of talks in addition to, to the installation because a lot of people couldn't come to see the show because as soon as the show opened, we, we went into another lockdown. And so, the way to kind of experience a lot of the things that they were exploring through this 
this um, exhibition, which included a periodical that went along with it, was to have a moment to engage online. So when we're thinking about this, uh, you know, curating as facilitating, for me, it was kind of like, you know, I really, again, I was sort of, I took a back seat and I was more of a facilitator and helped them um, to sort of bring things together. And that was, that was an extremely rewarding project for me. Um, it was just really, we're, it's interesting because we're talking about building relationships, but then as curators, you don't really talk about what it is that you get out of mm -hmm. working with people. And one of the things, usually the majority of times when I do a project, it's something that's really fulfilling for me. And I was reading this um, piece, I can't remember who the author's name was today, and she was writing about um, this sort of movement to ban books in the States. And she, and she was reflecting on, I think this, this person was raised in a very sort of uh, Christian and conservative, she had a very Christian and conservative upbringing. And um, she was talking about her relation to books and how um, uh, certain things, there were attempts by like the librarian at her school and her family to prevent her from reading certain things. But she was saying that, that for so many people, um, books provide an opportunity to see reflections of your own experience um, and have them be affirmed. And you're getting basically your own experience, your own identity, um, yourself affirmed by, um, I guess, in literary forms. Mm -hmm. And I'm bringing that up to say that this is something that happens with curating and the way that um, I didn't talk about any of the slides that we've shown about these past projects um, because I was more interested in kind of talking about what it is that curating does. But, you know, what I'm, I've known Sandra Brewster for a while. I think we first met in, I can't even remember when we first met. It might've been 2006 or something. And my understanding of her work has really grown and shifted. And when I first met Sandra, she should probably get mad at me for saying this. She was very reluctant to kind of speak about her work and she's not in, in the same way. Or maybe she was just reluctant with me. But one of the things that I kind of realized was I come to this work with, um, it's not that I don't need to think about it or I don't need to research it or I don't need to ask the artist how she's positioning it or what she's thinking of, but because we're both, we're both, um, the first generation daughters of parents from the Caribbean, there, there is this certain sort of cultural knowledge that you bring forward to the work. And when Takaluk was speaking, and I think Vince, this is something that you think about as well, you have this, again, as a steward, you feel this kind of sense of responsibility to, um, and this care that you're bringing forward to the objects because the, they're the result of someone's labor. They're the result of someone's, um, it can be speaking to where they're located. There is so much um, sort of, I don't want to, um, I don't want to sort of over sentiment, over sentimentalize these things, but there's something that's very, um, it's sort of like, I hate when people use this term, but it is doing soul work. And there is this way in which people are, they're embedded in the works that they produce. And you're kind of, it's sort of, it's not sort of, it's kind of like, it's an extension of their thought, their, their thinking, their labor, their care. Um, there's something that's very intimate and something that's really important about the ways in which we present this work. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, a huge privilege to be able to do this work. And it's also a huge responsibility. And there's also something particularly in this moment, um, I think, I talk like you did touch on this and I think Vince, you did as well. There's a way in which um, there's something where in some ways the work that we do, I kind of see myself as a buffer, not that it's always needed, but there are ways in which um, you're not only necessarily trying to present this work so that it can be properly engaged with so that there can be multiple readings of a work, but you're also frequently trying to prevent um, harm from being done to work. 
And um, I think Taka, like you were talking about this, how so many institutions will have collections, but they don't necessarily have the depth of knowledge um, that is necessary to animate these works. And there are ways in which you're trying to prevent, say, works from being exploited or being positioned in particular ways that don't really further the intents of the artist. So um, these are, I guess these are things that I'm, I'm thinking about. And I think um, they're, they're, I think just thinking about all of the things that um, the fellow panelists have said and things that I think about um, with, I guess the artists who I work with, the things that they're exploring, the ways that they open up, how we can understand, um, say indigeneity or place or, or colonization. Um, but I, I just, I think, um, I guess coming back to this notion of care, um, there's something that's very potent in, in this, this work um, that we're doing, that all of us are doing, not just curators, but like artists and, and other arts practitioners as well. What you said, Sally, really reminded me of like a quote by Emily Changer that I really like uh, repeat often. Um, mm -hmm. That sort of came out in the process of us working on a collaborative text together last spring. Um, and she talks about how curating for her was a way of finding a way to belong to a place, mm -hmm. to, to belong to Toronto. And Toronto is so much looked like the locus of her work. Um, and that's how she kind of uh, conceptualizes these sort of relational kind of practices and like that's really been key for me as well and yeah in that way it is very much like personal and very much like soul work because yeah I think so much of, of collective offerings too is about is about kind of being able to ground yourself somehow being able to sort of like find yourself in this like kind of flailing matrix of like screens and and hyper stimulation but also like isolation and being like removed from people um so yeah, I really think about that a lot. It's interesting. One of the Chris Lim, who's on here, is a student. He's one of he's one of the attendees tonight. He's a student. He was pulling together some notes um, and found this reference to um, an idea by Magdalena Hartsova, who's a researcher who, who suggested that you know, um, so you know, institutions themselves are a problem, right? I mean, just structurally, you've all said that I think they cha they're challenging to work with and, and to kind of, um, um, but you know, one of, one of the things she suggested is that the abstraction of care and curatorial practice has led it to, the, to often be um, kind of interwoven with incidents that show a lack of care, right? And so the thing about artwork though, that I'm hearing from all of you, and it's something that I've recognized as a curator as well, is that, you know, the artwork as, is so tangible that, you know, it, it kind of um, doesn't allow that sort of um, abstraction, <laughs> right? So it's, um, and, and I think that's what sort of like really strong curating is and, and why it's recognizable in these projects we're showing is like, it's very, like there's no abstraction, right? It's, um, it's, 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 and it's because the artists are also, you know, they're, um, they're showing their own experiences that have that are not abstracted at all. Um, so it's an interesting, I think, I mean, so when we're talking about curatorial practice, we are talking very much about institutions or the sites of curation as well. Um, and we know, I mean, just, you know, institutions like art history have been very much kind of tied to colonial histories and colonial practices. Um, do you think kind of overtly, I know Sally, you've talked about this in terms of like working with Decolonize This Place and their project was very much about, you know, um, and all of their conversations were very much about like decolonizing practices and like through um, and through dialogue and of talking about, um, you know, very concrete expressions of decolonization. Um, Vince, did you think about that with collective offerings? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things with collective offerings and what it was trying to do was that, so a lot of the artists involved in collective offerings are themselves engaged in, particularly Shaista, 
um, are engaged in processes of in institutional critique and reform um, sort of internally, not in terms of showing their work, but in terms of engaging like institutions that have displayed harmful behavior and trying to pull them into rep reparative processes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and actually the the ground for the exhibition was was often like you know or sort of frustration with that process um and for me particularly um because i did i guess i've written more than i've curated um and a lot of that has to do with this idea of like of critically like questioning things that position themselves as decolonizing a canon. So my particular area of interest is very much South Asian art history. Um, and in recent years, there's been kind of like, a, it, now it's like a, a, a case of competing canons, right? Because of sort of commercial interests. There is this strong desire to create sort of um, a compendium of South Asian masterworks that kind of align with certain ideas of nation states, certain ideas of, dominant culture, certain ideas that are also like palatable to kind of European ideas of modernism. Um, and it really is about like sort of uh, pumping up the value of collectors portfolios and, and, and finding um, ways to justify to uh, Western institutions that have run out, well, that can't afford um, a lot of contemporary art made in the West uh, to acquire them um, as, as being of historical significance. And in the process of that, I found it, 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 it becomes quite violent epistemically really, because I mean, to kind of give a stark example of that, um, right before the pandemic started, I was at the Dhaka Art Summit, which is in Bangladesh, it's my hometown. I grew up in Dhaka. Um, I happened to be there with like the AGYU team because they were um, researching their show that they did last fall with Good School. Um, and, you know, it was this entire kind of choreographed event where all these white people could come and like fulfill their weird exotic fantasies, um, lots of self-actualization happening. It was actually quite dizzying. Um, and, and, you know, um, while they boast like hundreds of thousands of people going through, as soon as all of the international art people left, suddenly there were security guards at every corner, you know, policing how you move through the space. Um, you know, uh, the, the opening work was this thing that was making references to deep time. I think it was Adrian Villa Rojas. I was making references to deep time to like environmentalism, but you know, you had to, um, because of security restrictions, you can take liquids into the building. So you had like, there was this giant pile of plastic water bottles because also there was no like drinkable water other than you buying these like very overpriced bottles of plastic water and and then there were like um people who like pick through them you know and, and to, to sell those things to recycling facilities um they were picking through them and it was just like the irony was somehow lost on people um so a lot of my writing tends to confront those material conditions and there seems to be a lot of intransigency around confronting them um in our field because I mean, you know, there's all sorts of economic incentives to do so. Um, and so I find often that when I do write a critical essay, what I met with is a lack of capacity in terms of thinking like about what kinds of harms are caused because, because of, a, of a lack of thinking laterally also. It's always about this kind of ascendant axis of like, you know, like they were back down here and now we're up here, like kind of thing. Um, and so collective offerings was a way of kind of being like, what happens if we kind of st stopped engaging in this discourse of like institutions and representation and diversity, things that are also like, you know, corporate HR speak that comes from the, from the 80s and, and 90s, right? Um, and, and got back to different ways of relating to each other, what forms of knowledge can be generated and out of that, what kind of criticality can emerge as well, right? So that when you write an article saying that, you know, yeah, this is this is work about the history of a genocide, but it's also an extremely like male perspective on that genocide that like erases the gendered violence that went on in it. I'm referring to a specific article that I wrote um, that people don't just come back and say, well, it's a it's an artist of color. Why do you hate artists of color? 
um, you know, that it that we can hold that multiplicity as well. And Taka, like just picking up on that, I think you spoke to this idea of, you know, trying to address the harms that have been created using Vince's language. It, you, when you're talking about different ways of, you know, um, having Inuit sort of creating exhibitions that are created by and um, contain the work of Inuit um, artists and, um, you know, for Inuit audiences, right? Sort of t doing it, creating exhibitions on a completely different term. Um, that, that sort of, I imagine that's in response to the kind of the harm that has been created historically. First of all, I just want to say that I feel like Sally hit several nails on the head <laughs> in her earlier comments. Uh, that that sense of responsibility is very heavy at times. I think that um, you know the indigenous art world, so-called indigenous art, and the in Inuit art world. They're small places where people know each other and are connected, both professionally and familiarly. <laughs> um, and you know, by community connections, all kinds of there's all kinds of connections. Like we don't, um, we're we are in relation with uh, other artists, other community members, even after we leave whatever gallery or whatever, you know, workplace we're involved when involved in. So like our first relationship is really with these people as our community members, um, and. Uh, no, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> well, you were saying Sally hit a couple of nails on the head. Right, but before that, I, oh. I, I was, because I've been wanting, I've been holding on to that one and then I lost yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just sort of tying Vince's comment about the, you know, addressing the harms that have been oh, yeah. created and that, that mm -hmm. you know, you're sort of starting at a point of, you know, a try, you know, a dealing with those harms, but this is how you do it. You know, you, you sort of yeah. recreate I, the exhibition. I don't know if I think about it so much in terms of, of harm, but really in reconnecting. Like I would, you know, it, almost like dropping people's names, but like uh, I listened to a talk by Wanda Nanabush recently that she did for Cam Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, and she was talking about, um, you know, what you center is the thing that, you know, you put your energy into and the thing that you bring about. So what I want to center is, you know, um, amplifying Inuit voices, bringing Inuit together with our heritage, um, bringing uh, new work and new culture, new uh, forms of Inuit culture uh, to light as other Inuit want them to be brought to light. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course there is all that harm. There, there's this huge, there's this, you know, the Inuit art movement in Canada is famous. It's, I, I sometimes say it's like the mascot of Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you go to any foreign office or, or foreign embassy, Canadian embassy in a foreign country and you go to any bank, you can see Inuit art on Grey's Anatomy. Real Inuit art, art on the walls, in, on the set in Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> um, you know, and a lot of that... Uh, movement of Inuit art, uh, you know, all that stuff was sold away and became part of collections and earns record prices on auction in all kinds of places away from Inuit homelands and their family members still exist and don't have any of those things. And, you know, it's great that the family members could make the money back then and provide for their families and build the you know, cooperatives and all that. Um, you know, it's not that they didn't want to sell those things, but the fact remains that a lot of our culture has bled out and um, how can we access those things? So I try to do that in small ways. One personal project that I have is uh, finding smaller works by historical works by uh, certain family members and trying to reconnect them with family members and communities that I know. So for example, in Nunavik, I know all uh, you know, I know the family names by community. Um, and if I find work by their family members, then I try to either, uh, you know, see if they want to buy it or 
you know, if it's not too expensive, see if I can buy it. I had actually a, a dealer here in Ottawa. He, when I told him about that, he recently gave me uh, three sculptures to give back to family members. Oh, wow. In, um, in three different communities in Nunavik. So I, I, I was really touched by that. I would like to see more of that. You know, I try to encourage, you know, people who have historical collections, like if you're buying stuff now, you know, that's being sold now, that's made today, not so much, but the, the historical stuff where people, you know, are really trying to reconnect. Um, I think, you know, those things that sell for record prices on auction are actually way more valuable than that, that price. They're, they're priceless to us as Inuit. So, you know, I have the privilege of having access to some of this art world stuff. Um, and I never, I, I don't feel like I'm moving through it as like somebody who, oh, my ambition is to be, you know, the best and the greatest and to make this huge career. It's really about, okay, once I get this opportunity, how can I uh, translate it into a benefit for my community? And I feel like that goes a little bit to what uh, Sally was saying about that, that kind of weight of responsibility. Like you have this very particular knowledge that you bring to that relationship that you have with Sandra Brewster, Brewster that you've built with her. Um, and it, it's like invaluable that that particular self that you bring to that relationship, but it doesn't translate into having the most spectacular rich career <laughs> it's like there's so there's so much so many little things in that in those kind of relationships that you have to do and little bumps along the road that you have to address and you know being that buffer and being and doing all those little tiny battles that you have to do that don't seem like anything to somebody who's not in your position um, those are the things that uh, you know are kind of the most important thing that is going on behind the scenes in this kind of work. Well, thank you all. Um, do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? Do you have any questions for each other? I just want to say thank you to both of you. I'm so thrilled that I was on <laughs> with the two of you. And thank you so much, Shauna, for bringing us together. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll have to kind of have a question. Is yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, at the last minute. Um, yeah, I, I keep thinking about this idea of, of responsibility, um, both in terms of curating enough work and also in terms of, um, you know, the Sandra Brewster show that you were talking about, Sally, how do you, um, how do you kind of negotiate this, the idea of like the colonizer's gaze on these objects? Because that's something that I always find myself kind of like trying to work with in the sense that, um, for example, in our show, Shireen's work is very like specific to, um, you know, Islamic occult sciences. Um, and we were sort of constantly apprehensive of like, are we kind of adding these like kind of exotifying orientalizing markers to it? Um, so I wonder how you negotiate that. I think, um, I think there are some things where I'm just, uh, it was interesting because I had uh, I had this conversation with one of the MFA students at well. Uh, we had a studio visit and we were kind of talking about this, how there are these really weighty histories that are embedded in certain works. And, um, and at a certain point, it's just, it is what it is. So I think one of the things that's interesting um, that, you know, I kind of think about and decolonize this place has sort of brought this up. Um, because, you know, there were, in dialogue with them, the issue of abolishing institutions has arisen. Um, and it's interesting, too, because a lot of, a lot of the members of that collective, they work in institutions, right? They, because the academic institution, that's an institution as well. 
Um, so I think there are ways, so I'm kind of talking around it and then I'll answer you directly. Like there are a couple of things, like I think about this, for example, like the three of us are having this conversation through Guelph and we're speaking in English, right? And that's a mark of colonization. And we all respectively, like culturally, we, the fact that we are speaking English, that's a mark of, it's a violence, right? Essentially. But then at the same time, it's allowing us we are where we're at and it's allowing us to connect with each other. And there, and I think it's really interesting because with Sandra in particular, when we talk, when we talk about her work, um, and this is something that comes up again and again, um, Sandra, Sandra's work, Sandra in particular, and I think this also comes up with, um, you know, with so many artists, but like we're looking at, Sandra's work and Maria Hupfield's work was up there. It was Native Art Department, but also Maria Hupfield in particular. There's this, this kind of deep um, love and uh, sort of commitment for the communities that they are connected to. So as much as, you know, any artist, you, you would make the work and you'd, you'd have shows in your living room for your family and friends if you weren't looking to, commu to communicate to larger audiences. So that's one thing. And then there are multiple ways um there are multiple audiences who can engage in your work you never know who's going to see your work so for example there's um someone who works at Guelph um a contract employee who's from Colombia and we showed a Carolina Quesero work and this person was delighted to encounter that work because they heard Spanish and they knew it was the accent of one of the speakers in the pieces they knew the person was Colombian right so there are ways in which you can and again Spanish it's, an, it's another like linguistic marker of, of colonization but it was still it was also speaking to this very particular identity so I think like to go back to like to use Sandra's work as an example when Sandra is making work a lot of the time she's not solely speaking to but she's very much in dialogue with with um Caribbean audiences and um and say like African diasporic audiences and not just solely those those communities, but those are people, those are audiences or communities that she's very cognizant of when she's she's making work. And there are times when she'll produce work and people who are from particular communities will walk into the space and they'll be able to identify it and other people will need to read the didactics. So this is something she's very cognizant of. And I think there are ways, there are ways like, it's kind of interesting too. Like, I think it's an interesting kind of, um, like thinking about Edouard Glissant and how he writes about opacity and, and um, this way in which, you know, like in the West, you know, I think, you know, obviously he's kind of speaking to Caribbean communities, but like, we don't need to make everything transparent for wider audiences. And I, I was thinking about this in terms of, I took this course years ago. Um, it was this art theory course and the instructor when, what, what year was this? I think it was like in 2004 or something, 2005. And this was, um, there were lots of, I don't, this is terrible. I cannot remember when um, gay marriage was legalized in Canada, but I remember the conversations at the time where it was like, what does it mean to be um, kind of validated uh, by the mainstream? And what is this doing to this kind of, um, like there are ways in which, like I'm just even thinking about particular codes in terms of how people dressed and like, it was a matter of survival, but it was a way of like, kind of maintaining this particular culture. And, and what does that mean when it's kind of dispersed to a broader audience? So I, I don't think I answered your question at all. I don't think I answered your question at all. It was more like a stream of consciousness in response to what you were saying. I really don't think there is an answer, honestly. I think it's no. just like, hoping for like strategies yeah because we also yeah the, the opacity thing is really really like like I, I I think I'm still trying to understand Guisson's work in so many ways um but you know just kind of building these little walls around the work to kind of protect it and not sort of explain little bits of it um that's what we were trying to do hopefully we were successful with Shireen's work for example where we didn't want to explain geomancy we were just like here's a thing um, and there are yet yeah, kernels that you can connect to that are very visceral and, and kind of emotional. But yeah, I wonder I, how that encounter translated for different people. 
I'm sorry, like tech, like you haven't responded. I don't know if you wanted to say something because I was going to say something else too, but. Oh, go ahead, continue with your thought. I forgot the question already. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. like in terms of, like there are always multiple ways of reading a work and there are multiple um, kind of portals of engagement with the work. And, uh, and I think there are, I think there are strategies in terms of, you know, how things are, like within the context of how a work is installed in a space, you know, the interpretive text, the way in which, um, like the kind of intro panel, the, the wall labels, the if there's an accompanying essay, like these are all things that can talk about positioning a work or if a work that kind of largely refuses um, entry into it, you know, if you talk about that refusal and what that means, you know, what it means to encounter something like that, that can open up, um, you know, how you're considering art and not just this particular piece. Um, there is a, there is um, an artist, I can't remember her name. This is the evening. Well, all my evenings are like this where I can't remember artist names. Um, but there was this artist who um, I remember when I was in grad school, my class, we went to, I think it was, I can't remember what museum we went to, but it, it was this um, space in the Netherlands and it was, they had this huge campus and there was this piece that we gathered to speak about and one of my classmates had to do a presentation on it and this artist um, they've since passed they're Iranian but they did this series of paintings and they were buried in the ground so he kind of gathered at the site where they were there and I remember just coming back and thinking thinking about what that gesture meant and just kind of imagining what the paintings look like and and imagining what the artist you know what their desire was in that and how they imagined that future audiences would be, you know, what their response to that would be. So I think, um, I think there are all, there are all, there are multiple ways in which you can and cannot resist the colonial gaze. Uh, there was one question I know we've gone yeah. over, but I feel like since <laughs> to ask the question so, we should address it yeah. so ellie uh writes i found it was interesting that you showed images of the exhibition of the exhibitions each curator has worked on how would you visually or conceptually represent the labor you put into your practice including relationship building aka the behind the scenes work okay i'm gonna make a response um i don't know how you would represent this but I think one of the things that's really interesting about the arts is how much invisible labor there is and there's a way in which um, the visual arts in particular are romanticized and um, and even like I was having this discussion I've been having this discussion with multiple people over the past several months um, just the idea you know when we we think about um, it's not really a cliche, but this, this, you know, trope of the starving artist and how you kind of have to pay your dues. And I'd like, and I think it's interesting because of outside of say, um, working, working in, um, being a writer, being a musician, being a performer, being a visual artist, um, there usually aren't other jobs that exist where we would say it was acceptable that you have to do three other jobs so that you can perform this one thing. Like we wouldn't say, oh, that's okay. This lawyer has to have three other jobs so that they can practice law or this surgeon has to have three other jobs so that they can, you know, you can do your surgery at night, right? And of course there are ways in which we don't, but you know, why aren't we equating these things in the same way? And I think one of the things it's interesting because I'm sure you would get pushed back from different people depending on what role they occupy in the, in the field of art. But um, there's a way in which the labor that curators perform is rendered invisible. 
and it kind of should be, um, it kind of um, should be because it's about, you know, the labor that we perform is predicated on the labor of artists producing work, right? You know, we read about it, we, you know, we place it, we, um, or sorry, we speak about it, we write about it, et cetera. But I think there are ways in one of, um, talk like you, you spoke about this, and this is something that I've started doing with some of the artists who I know more intimately, or I've had more extensive relationships with, where I've started blatantly saying like everything that I negotiate for you on behalf of the institution, I'm the one who pays the, the price for that. So if I'm in a place that doesn't, you know, say if I'm working outside of Canada in a space that doesn't normally pay artist fees, the resentment of the institution having to pay the artist is directed towards me as the organizer. It's not visited upon the artist, not that it should be, but it's sort of like they don't think about these things or the, the work that you're doing as like a racialized person in this space and how you're operating in this space of precarity already. And, um, and I think... I don't know how you would make, I mean, discussing these things, that's a way of making it visible. Or if um, even, you know, this sort of writing a text, the amount of energy that goes into that and, um, and even producing a text, the amount of like researching and then the kind of like um, thinking, like the time that you need to allot to thinking and kind of, um, uh, absorbing that material and, and kind of reconstituting it in different ways. Um, I think that's a lot of labor that people aren't necessarily um, aware of. And that's before, again, like you get to all of the admin and kind of back and forth in the emails and things like that. Um, and I think, you know, there are ways in which artist labor is rendered invisible as well, um, because they often, they, they, put you know the same amount of labor into the work that they do like we're sort of seeing you know an end result but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily embody all of the work that goes that goes into their practice and maintaining it that reminds me of a show that Denise Viner did at Or Gallery, where uh, the two artists just like painted the walls white, like constantly. Um, and then you had the sounds of it playing to kind of try to render some of that invisible labor visible. But then, yeah, you're so right in the sense that, you know, going back to that earlier point of like responsibility and these, the intimacy of these personal relationships, sometimes also to guarantee the conditions of safety for creating the work, I feel like you need to keep these relationships private. If you publicize it too much, then fissures begin to, to sort of, I think, emerge. Um, and also, if it becomes a replicable methodology, then it also becomes something that then people like co-opt and kind of use as a way of like crossing people's boundaries, more or less. Yeah. Because I think that's also another side of this kind of work is that sometimes you have curators who are way too um, sort of overbearing or, or, yeah. or personal and professional too much. Yeah. And... And I think, um, again, that kind of goes back to this sort of, like kind of the currency of that notion of opacity where you don't need to explain everything. But that is, that is another, you know, everyone doesn't approach the work that they're doing in the same way. And I think one of the things is that, um, I think, uh, again, this idea of like the invisible curator and the knowledgeable voice of the institution. Um, I think, you know, kind of maybe talking a bit more about the fact that, you know, none of these positions are neutral um, and they're all informed by where we stand in relation to things. And I think what's interesting is about um, I guess the work that the three of us are doing, but not just the three of us, other people who are from similar backgrounds is like, there's no, you're not really, it's not that we're claiming it or we're expressing a desire for it, but because of the fact that we're race, racialized subjects, we're not, we're implicated, we're seen as being implicated in the work, whereas everyone is implicated in the work that they do and everyone's culture and experience and their, 
racial identity plays into their work. It's just some people are, you know, kind of granted, they're bestowed with this kind of, um, I guess it's sort of like a false construct of neutrality. Um, and others, we, we are never granted that. So, but I think again, but again, it's kind of like, you know, I can't really say that I'm desiring that because one of the reasons why some of these works uh, resonate with me, like there, there are also, there are people who I've worked with and works that um, I find compelling and practices I find compelling that are outside of my own experience, but there's always something that, um, there's something personal that, whether it's like, you know, just I'm interested in this, like I'm interested in abject things, right? And, um, but, but I think, you know, that kind of these, have, basically having skin in the game, like literally and figuratively, that kind of strengthens the work that you're doing in many ways. That's not the be all and end of it, but it's, I think, I think it's a strain. Any other thoughts? <laughs> we have lots of thank yous from people too. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. This was this is so lovely. And <laughs> so it's so good to actually have you all here in conversation. So um, we should be able to do this in person. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's almost, almost here. So anyway, thank you all um, uh, for your thoughts. I think they were really, really critical um, at this moment and, and beyond this moment. So thank you for sharing. And uh, oh, hello, Erin. Um, uh, take care, and uh, we will all talk soon. And this uh, this will be was recorded and will be on available on our website under our art talk section if you want to visit it later. Um, and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Take care.